Ark the Herald Angel Sing. <clears throat> Mr. Wesley. Ark the Herald Angel Sing. Glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the sky. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. My heart's am adored. Christ the everlasting Lord, late in time, behold he come, offspring of a virgin womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hailed incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the herald Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all he brings, friends with healing in his wing. Mildly lays his glory by, Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Come desire of nations come. Fix in us thy humble home. in us the serpent's head. Adam's likeness now we face. Stamp thine image in his place. Second Adam from above. Reinstate us in thy love. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that we can sing about your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, God, thank you for Mr. Charles Wesley. He wrote some good songs, Lord, uh, praise, uh, praising your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and talking about all the wonderful things that uh, he did when he came. And Lord, to help us tonight to think of you, and, and God, give us what we uh, need from the scriptures. Help us to worship you and praise you, Lord. Uh, bless us now as we sing and uh, pray and do the things we're here to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, well, uh, Victor's uh, coming home. Um, let's uh, pray for everybody that's not here tonight. Um, pray that they'll be able to uh, uh, come Sunday. It, it's hard to get folks out on, on, in, in, in the cold. Amen. What number did you say? Next one. 85, okay. Ah, that's a good one. What old Lutheran hymn, amen. Silent night, holy night, all is calm. Oh,
Christ the Savior is born. Christ the Savior is born. Silent night, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beings from thy holy face, with a dawn of redeeming praise, Jesus Lord at thy birth, Jesus Lord at thy birth. All right, thank you, Miss Cindy. Now we'll sing that one another night. It's okay. There are all kinds of them out there. Just a few. It was here. I don't have to draw it on the board when you look at it. You like that? <laughs> Silly picture, isn't it? <sighs> Turn to Psalm 64. Tonight I want to preach on Beware Falling Tongues. Amen. Beware Falling Tongues. Psalm 64, verse number 8. Yeah, I know i got a weird imagination, but that's, that's, this is what I see when I read this verse of X and Big Tony, Big Tony, go whap. But, you know, that does happen to people that don't watch what they say. Uh, it says in Psalm 64, verse 8, So they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. Uh, amen? All they that see them shall flee away. Yeah, I guess I would flee away if I saw that. Amen? <laughs> Some guy getting hit on the head with his own tongue. Heavenly Father, help us now. Help us to watch what we say, God. And remember, we can be our worst enemy. God, help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, going up and down the highway, uh, one of the things you used to see a lot of uh, going up through the mountains, and I, I didn't get out to the Rockies, but most of this was out in the Appalachians, but you still see uh, uh, places where there's a lot of these signs. It says, Beware Falling Rocks. And I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know why certain places have falling rocks and other places don't see uh, have falling rocks but some some seem to be more prone to it um, but when you when you travel here and there you see these things and, and you do need to be careful because uh, I, I did once or twice run across big chunks of uh, rocks that were in the middle of the road that had come down off the side of a mountain somewhere and I and as I you know went around them and everybody else had to stop on the other side uh, you know, while I got by, you know, I thought, well, what would it have been like to have been here when that come down? That wouldn't have been good to the top of the car, and, and me either. It just went clunk, and I, you know, one of them was pretty big. A couple of them were just, you know, little ones, but I did see a big one one time. Um, you know, so uh, we, we go through and we have to beware of things. Well, you know, we're in the holiday season. Um, everything nowadays is, everything's got a positive spin put on it, as they say. Uh, but reality is different. Uh, holidays, well, let me tell you the truth about holidays in America. There's a lot more accidents, especially in automobiles, for various reasons during the holidays. For one, people travel more. Uh, the second reason, people drink more. That, that's always a good uh, start of an accident. Um, 
the second thing about holidays in America is during the holidays, uh, there's a large amount of the population that seems to abandon their basic normal standards of behavior because it's the holidays. They eat too much or they drink too much or they party too much or whatever too much. Spend too much. Um, yeah, and that seems to be a plague in our country. Um, as a preacher, I advocate everybody ought to behave all the time. Now, that doesn't mean you can't enjoy the holiday time, but you don't have to abandon your standards, your biblical standards of behavior just 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 because it's the holidays. Uh, people make more debt uh, this time of year than any other time of year. They do. Um, they feel that if they don't spend an excess amount of money on their family and their children and their people at work and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they haven't done proper Christmas. Well, have you ever just tried to spend within your limits to see if you, you can? And, and do what I do. I pray about it. And I ask God what to buy people. And I, I, I uh, there have been years I haven't stayed within my budget. But here the last few years, I, I, God's been really good to me. Um, and people let down their guard this time of year. And frankly, a lot of times they get in a mess. Um, you don't know how many times I've sat down with somebody uh, at the end of the service of a rescue mission or at the jail visiting there or something. And the story they're telling me starts out in the holidays. It's, it's an amazing how many of them start bad stories start out at Christmas and Thanksgiving and uh, the holiday time. Um, but one of the things we need to be careful of is, uh, well, ourselves and things that we say. Um, notice that this verse outlines it very clearly for us. It says, uh, so they shall. Well, they, they shall, well, they, they, that's a personal problem people have during this time of year. So what kind of personal problem are you talking about? Well, um, mainly a lot of people get going the wrong way, going the wrong way. You know, there's a right way to go and there's a wrong way to go. Uh... Somebody has said recently that one of the biggest problems we've had in our society is the abandonment of the idea of right and wrong. I believe this was said by Bill O'Reilly in a column that I read. Now, now Bill O'Reilly is a lost Catholic as far as I know, but just because he's, he's not the same religion we are, doesn't mean he doesn't have some basics down. And one of the things he believes in is right and wrong. And you ought to believe in right and wrong. Uh, keeps a lot of people out of trouble. And it brings them to the right road a lot of times where God wants them to be. If, if uh, You say even if they're going down the wrong road? Well, sometimes especially if they're going down the wrong road because at the end of that road, guess who's waiting on them? It's God trying to get them back to turn around the other way. Uh, so a lot of people go down the wrong road. Uh, 2 Timothy 4.4 4 says, uh, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and it shall be turned unto fable. So here's some people in the Bible. They've turned away from the truth. Say, I want to go down the road where there's truth at the end. I want to go down the road where God's at the end and heaven's at the end, and I've done the right way the whole long. I don't want to have to meet God at the end of the wrong road, and he says, whoops, you've messed up, you better turn around and hurry, because the next step is you know where. See, that's that's the wrong way to go. Uh, a lot of the people, when they go down the wrong road, sometimes they get stuck. Getting stuck is a problem with this generation we have here. A lot of them are stuck. 2 Timothy 3 9 says, They shall proceed no further, they're stuck, for their folly shall be made manifest unto all men as theirs was also. Look, you get stuck in a bad place doing the wrong thing with the wrong people at the wrong time for the wrong amount of whatever it is you're doing, uh, it's going to hurt. And if you're not careful, um, 
people are going to look at you and say, you're not doing real good, you know, such and such and such, and you're going to be stuck, and you won't know how to get out of it. Uh, God never sticks people in a bad situation unless he needs to turn them around to the right thing. If you put yourself in a bad situation, uh, now God will get you out, but you're going to have to come his way uh, to him to get him to get you out of it. If you try to get yourself out of it a lot of times when you get stuck, well, you're, you'll stay stuck. Um, you know what's wrong with this generation? We're guided by the wrong voices in a lot of cases. People are listening to the wrong people saying the wrong things. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 says, When they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now that's a second advent verse, but it, it illustrates uh, very nicely what happens. They listen to people, you know, they're saying nice things, peace and safety, and then the train hits them. Um... A fellow died, I guess it was yesterday. His name was Norman Lear. Now, some of you may not know who Norman Lear is, but when I was um, probably 11 or 12, Norman Lear started making TV shows. Um, and this guy, he was born in 1922, and he died at 101 yesterday. Boy, it seems like the worst people live longest. You say worst people? Yeah, he was a TV producer. And he wanted to make TV shows that challenged the social norms. So he changed the TV sitcom, and instead of being a funny little show about funny little people like Andy Griffith or, you know, some of the stuff that people were used to seeing, uh, he wanted to showcase his liberal, anti-Bible, anti-American uh, swill, frankly. That's what it was. It was swill. Uh, he made All in the Family and Maud and the Jeffersons and Sanford and Sons and Good Times and One Day at a Time. They were filled with dirty, sleazy, immortal ideas and propaganda. That's what they were filled with. Uh, if you ever see some reruns, watch one and see what I mean. Uh, they weren't worth any real decent American family watching them. But they were different, so everybody watched them. And they became, he became wildly popular. Um, he made, then he made films. He made Divorce American Style. Uh, sometimes the public loved his films, like Fried Green Tomatoes and The Princess Bride. But if you look at Fried Green Tomatoes, which my wife wanted to see every time it comes on, there were some things about that show I didn't care a bit about, some of the things that it talked about and dealt with. Really, it, 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 it wasn't all that great of a movie as far as... It, it, it had that kind of down-home country thing, but, uh, you know, uh, that was a cover uh, just to talk about situations and, and morality that, uh, well, most Southerners probably wouldn't agree with. But if you put it down there and make a makeup story, people believe it. Uh, now, let me, let me show you. The, the, you say, well, he was just a TV guy. Yeah, but in uh, uh, 1987, a group led by Mr. Lear helped defeat Robert Bork in his nomination to the U.S. Supreme Court. And Mr. Lear became the prominent spokesman for the progressive wing of the Democrat Party. Uh, Reverend Jerry Falwell, founder of the Moral Majority, in a letter to the supporters, was moved to label him the greatest enemy of the American family in our generation. And I agree with him. Mr. Lear, for his part, called the religious right, this is what he called you and me, well-financed, highly coordinated, computerized campaign not just to preach their faith and their politics, which they have every right to do, but to impose their political and moral beliefs upon the rest of us. Well, what do you think Mr. Lear was doing? Playing Pinochle down in the basement? No, he was doing the same thing. He just didn't like it because in a lot of ways Jerry Fowler was more effective than he was.
thank God. Ding dong, the witch is dead. He said, that's not a nice thing to say about a fellow. Yeah, because he died and went to hell, I'm afraid. But uh, don't listen to people like that. They're the wrong voices. Secondly, people can make a mess. They can make a mess. Um, Isaiah 49 Verse 17 says, Thy children shall make haste, thy destroyers, and they that made thee waste shall go forth of thee. Um, talking about people that were making a mess of uh, the children of Israel. They were destroying them and making a mess of their country and their religion and everything. Um, that's because Israel had gotten too big for its britches. And I'm afraid sometimes America gets too big for its britches. Um, you know, you got to be careful or you'll make a mess. Ran across a little story. Now, this is kind of funny. Uh, Krispy Kreme man. Uh, he was delivering Krispy Kreme donuts to a military base um, up in the, ter uh, the state of Alaska. And... Uh, this little store uh, that was right there uh, at the edge of the base, I guess, you know, some of these bases don't have real fencing. So uh, he's got his truck parked out there, his donut truck, and he's getting the donuts, and he goes into the store, and he didn't close the door of the back of the donut truck. So out of the woods next to where this little base starts, here comes a couple black bears. <laughs> and bears like sweets. <laughs> so the guy comes out, and the whole back of his truck is just torn up. There's donuts all over the place. Half of them are gone. <laughs> and there's a trail of half-eaten donuts going into the woods. <laughs> and he kind of hears these bears in the woods, and he figures he knew what happened. <laughs> the bears got to the donuts. You know what he should have done? He should have closed the door of the truck. <laughs> oh, bears. Ooh, that's no good. <laughs> ooh, ooh, mm, mm. Sprinkles. Amen. Uh, look, uh, uh, we, we can make a mess. We don't even need bears to make a mess. Amen. Uh, sometimes uh, we put effort in the messes that we make. We put effort and emotions into the wrong team. Um, there's nothing wrong with putting effort into the Lord's work or your family or, uh, you know, doing a good job, running your own business, perfectly good to put your effort into there, you know, to, to make money for your family. But some people, I mean, they get in the wrong, the weirdest, wrongest thing and put all their energy into just strange things. Ezekiel 27, 21 and they shall make themselves utterly bald for thee, and gird themselves with sackcloth, and they shall weep uh, for thee with bitterness of heart and bitter wailing. Well, that's what happens when you find out you've put all your emotions and effort into something that's just going to fall apart. Where do you think Christians are tonight? They're not in church. They're not in this church. Where are they at? Well, they're putting their emotions and effort into something else besides here. God's work. Thank God y'all are here. But I do want to say this. The good news is Jesus is coming back and he's going to clean up all this mess. Thank God. Revelation 17, 14. And they shall make war with the Lamb and the Lamb shall overcome them for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Thank God. He's coming to fix it and those of us that are with him, we're, we're on his team. Amen. And then there's a, there's a falling and a fleeing in this verse. Notice that people, people see all these people being uh, hit with their own tongues and their mouths are hurting their own selves and the Bible says they, that they shall see them and shall flee away. Uh, you know, there's people that I see that I want to get far, far away from. I do. Uh... You say, who, who are people? Well, disobedient people. Why? Because disobedience always brings disaster. It always does. 
Leviticus 27, 14. But if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments upon them that are left alive of you will I send a faintness in their hearts in the lands of their enemies and the sound of a shaken leaf shall chase them and they shall flee as fleeing from a sword and they shall fall where none pursueth. So the Bible says, look, uh, you 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 disobey me and you cause a mess. I'm gonna make it so you just uh, you hear some leaves crunching in the background. You're gonna run away thinking someone's after you and stuff. That's not very good. You know, uh, disobedience can cause great big disasters. Uh, I preached about this before the Johnstown flood. Usually the one I preach about is the one that happened in 1889. There was actually three Johnstown flood. I usually don't preach all three, but I, I want to talk about all three. Uh, the first one happened in 1889. Uh, it was called the Great Flood. 2,208 people were killed by this. Uh, Henry Frick, a millionaire, purchased uh, the Lake uh, Connemaw Dam and had it lowered to make a roadway across so him and his wealthy friends and their little hunting club could go across this dam to the place where they hunted stuff. Well, by lowering the dam, uh, that wasn't very smart. They made it so that if it did rain too much, the water would just come right over the dam. And they tried to put little, uh, like little, uh, you know, uh, floodways and stuff in it, but uh, they, they were very well maintained. Uh, a lot of them were uh, rusted shut, or the mechanisms didn't work. Um, and, uh, well... Uh, it, 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 it rained uh, from May 9th to May 31st and the excess rain finally covered the dam and flooded the valley below and killed all those people. Terrible thing. It was one of the worst disasters of the late 1800s in America. Of course, then they tried to fix the dam and repair it and make it safer. Trouble is, they didn't want to spend a lot of money on it, so in 1936, they had the St. Patrick's Day flood. It rained again from March 9th to March 22nd. Uh, over 30 inches of rain this time. Uh, the flood plains and, and, and the uh, remake of the, the dams, uh, it didn't hold. Uh, they really hadn't been completed by that date. Uh, they had financing trouble because of the Great Depression. On March 18th, uh, uh, the Quimisog Reservoir Dam broke, killing 25 people. Um, the warning system they had installed did help, but it didn't keep the people from dying that did die, and it didn't keep the towns and the valley from being flooded. So they went back to work, and they, they built what they thought was a pretty good system. That brings us to 1977. Long time. It was to build a pretty good system. Um, on the 19th of July, 12 inches of rain in one night. Six dams fail, failed. The trouble is, when they fixed up the dams, they left one of the original dams that had been built back in the 1800s. And this wasn't a stone dam or a concrete dam. It was a dirt dam. It was made of earthworks. Well, when this rain came, this, this, uh, it, it was called, let me see, what, what was the name of the dam? Um, I didn't write the name of the dam. But it completely failed. Uh, it completely destroyed uh, Tannerville, PA, killed 41 people. Um, despite the improvements in water channels and everything, it was just more rain in one night than everything could handle. In 1974, the Army Corps of Engineers released a report to the people of that area. Now, remember, the flood happened in 1977, so this is three years before the flood. The Army Corps, the Army Corps of Engineers released a report trying to warn the public and the leaders of the area of the danger that was still present in the dam system. Well, nobody paid attention. 
1943, the Corps had declared that the problem was solved and there was no more danger of flood and the area would be flood free. Well, everybody glommed upon that and they kept it in their heart and for years and years and years and whatever. And anybody, including the Army Corps of Engineers, said, yes, there was a danger. They'd say, no, no. In 1943, y'all said such and such and such and such and so and so. Well, yet the Laurel Run Dam, I wrote it down here, uh, it was still built by the Bethlehem Steel Company. It was made of earthenware in the 1800s. No concrete, no gates, and it failed first. Seven towns were flooded out. All these floods were caused by what? Human error. Disobedience can bring disaster. I want to say that attitude matters. You say, Brother Jeff, you preach about that every other sermon. Yeah, here it is again. Attitude matters. Whether you're falling down or fleeing away, you need to watch your attitude. Psalm 64, 8, And they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. All that see them shall flee away. Ah, uh, that's an attitude that people see. We as Christians should have a good attitude. Our attitude should, but no matter what bad happens, God can handle it. And finally, being dependent on self in the end always lets us down. Jeremiah 46, 6. Let, us, let not the swift flee away, nor the mighty man escape. They shall stumble and fall toward the north by the river Euphrates. There's the saying, look, you may be swift, you may be mighty, but you're going to stumble and you're going to fall sometime and you always can't depend on yourself to deliver yourself. You have to depend on the one who can deliver you and that's God. In conclusion, God can lift us up. I'm so glad of that. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Um, Isaiah 49, that's a good verse, verse 22, says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. That, that, that's a prophecy of what he's going to do to the nation of Israel when he finally delivers them. He's going to like, like put them on, on his shoulder like a little kid and carry them. Well, sometimes I've had the Lord do that to me spiritually. Carry me around when I couldn't carry myself. God can clean up our messes. Not only can he lift us up, but he can clean our messes up. Psalm 50, verse 23, Whosoever offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that... Ordereth his conversation aright, I will show the salvation of the Lord. Look, if you make a mess and you go to God and say, God, I made a mess, and you humble yourself in the mighty hand of God, He's going he gonna to help you. and He's going to send that Holy Ghost broom and sweep up your mess and, and make it better. Ah, uh, God will keep us from getting caught in a bad situation if we go to Him. Um, John 10, this is Jesus talking about the, the shepherd and the sheep. John 10, 7, then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep hear them not. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, before to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, seeing the wolf cometh and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not. For the sheep, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and am none of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Aren't you glad Jesus laid down his life for you and me? And he saves us, and he takes care of us like a little sheep. God, God tells us 
to depend on Him and be careful of ourselves because sometimes we can be our worst enemies. We really can. And you say, why do you preach to this about this time of year? Because this seems to be the time of the year some people are their worst own enemies. And I just need to put it out there on the YouTube and, you know, Maybe you need to tell someone you know that you've seen make a mess during the holiday. Hey, you need to be careful. You made a mess last Christmas or you made a mess two Christmases ago. Watch yourself. Heavenly Father, help us. Thank you, Lord, that we can be here in this nice warm building. And God, thank you that we can preach your word and hear what the, the Bible says. And uh, God, thank you, God, that uh, uh, you just take good care of us, Lord. Help the ones that are out of town, bring them back safe. Help the ones that are not here tonight, God. Um, maybe it's just too cold for them to get out or whatever. But I pray you just help us to uh, have more people on Wednesday night, and Sunday nights and things, Lord. Help folks to come to church. God, show them that they need you and they need to worship of you and need to hear the preaching of the Word of God. Help us now as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.